I had a I had a client once who his his life was was going fine as far as like on the surface he had a good job he had a family he had a kids but he just could not connect he felt like he wasn't even in love with his wife anymore he felt like he wasn't in love with his kids he didn't feel any of that and and so we worked with him through this process and then when uh, after he came back from his experience he told me that he understood what love really was and that he never really allowed himself to express that or to feel that love. Welcome to the Mindfulness Experience Podcast. I'm Keith Fiveson, your host and producer. Today we have Jared Reinhardt, Lead Integration Coach at Heroic Hearts Project, joining us to talk about veterans and their healing journeys through psychedelics. Jared is a former Marine who, after attending his first ayahuasca retreat in 2016, knew his mission was to help others through the plant medicine process. He is a certified transformational recovery and integration coach through Being True to You and has worked as an ayahuasca facilitator in Peru and other locations. With his experience in these fields, he works one-on-one -on -one with veterans to help them reach their personal goals for healing and success in their everyday journeys and their lives. Without further ado, let's welcome uh, Jared to the show. Jared, thank you for being here. How are you doing? It's so good to be here, man. I really, really appreciate you having me on the show. Oh, I was I was excited to have you here. I mean, I I really appreciated meeting you at the Wonderland Conference. We had a I thought we had good chemistry, and uh, I'm really excited for the work that you're doing. I I know that you're uh, uh, really involved with uh, all of this, and I'm excited to get involved with it too and jump into it with you. Can you tell us a little bit about your journey uh, to becoming an ayahuasca facilitator and transformational coach through being true to you and the kind of work you're doing with Heroic Hearts Project? Uh, yeah, so uh, to kind of preference it, I um, uh, way back when I was a Marine back in uh, 26, back in uh, 2011 is when I got out of the Marine Corps. Um, I was in for five years and like most Marines or most people that I know that got out of the military, that transition from military to civilian life is mm. hard one. Um, a lot of us honestly don't make it out alive uh, because right. it's so difficult. Um, so I was also having a hard time integrating. My relationships were failing. Um, my I couldn't hold a job, all those things. So I decided to become a contractor because that was where I felt like my skills mm -hmm. were best used. And the mind, the mind state that I was in um, was was more geared in that direction so i became contracting for about four years um uh after that point um on and off living in iraq and afghanistan for mm -hmm. uh, sometimes years at a time and during that time frame i um i when i'd come home on leave i had a group of friends uh that i would always go mm -hmm. see and we would do a psychedelic together when i would get home mm. Um, and that was usually at the end of a long party binge. So when mm -hmm. I was using them at the time, it wasn't really for healing. It was more for recreation. Mm -hmm. uh, but I did have this experience with DMT once that mm -hmm. that uh, that really altered my perspective. And um, and it was very fast. But I had a message in that in that ceremony or in that uh, experience, I should say, um, that if I have any questions, that I should go to the jungle. And I knew about this. I knew about this substance called ayahuasca um, for a while, but I did not think that looked like fun. It didn't mm -hmm. look like something I'd really want to mm -hmm. do. Mm -hmm. uh, but after that experience with DMT, I I was driven. Um, I would say somewhat called to that process to go to the jungle and find mm -hmm. out. So. Um, I went back to Iraq research locations in 2016. There wasn't much out there as far as information about mm -hmm. ayahuasca or whatnot. So I found a location in Pucallpa, Peru that did ceremonies for Westerners. And so I went down to Pucallpa on one of my next lead blocks and um, and drank ayahuasca four times at a retreat center called um, Nimi Akaya down in uh, Pucallpa. And, and mm -hmm. the... I, it, I don't really have the words to describe how that experience 
completely altered my understanding of reality mm -hmm. where I sit in it, how, um, how it all is. Um, and it was all in such a releasing way that mm -hmm. my, I had a very tense mindset about how I thought the world was. And this expanded that into a much more peaceful state. Mm. Uh, and I couldn't, I couldn't articulate it really then either, um, mm. what had happened. But um, so after that retreat, um, mm. I went back to Iraq for 11 months and mm. integrated out there. And for anybody listening, I wasn't in a, like a highly kinetic situation. It wasn't like I was getting in firefights every day or anything. Um, so it was a lot of time to integrate the mm -hmm. stuff that I learned from ayahuasca, hmm. um, which was simple things like uh, meditation, breathing, um, hmm. conscious relaxation, consciously checking hmm. with my body, hmm. uh, and and really getting to know people around me because I feel that I felt that I was missing connection in my life and. Hmm. I was the one that was preventing myself from feeling connected. So I wanted to start connecting with those around me. So mm. after that 11 months, I, um, I left that contract and, um, and it, it was a lot like leaving home because mm -hmm. I, uh, got to know the culture. I got to know the people, I got to know the people I worked with and I developed really strong relationships with them, mm. but I knew that contracting wasn't for me anymore. And, uh, being involved in the security industry wasn't really for me anymore either. So again, I didn't know what I was going to do. So I decided to go back to the Amazon jungle and work with ayahuasca again and mm -hmm. ask um, really like, what's the next step for me? Mm -hmm. And I got the feeling that I should stay in the jungle and learn more. So mm -hmm. I, um, after that retreat, I asked the facilitators at the retreat center and the maestros if I could stay and assist and learn. And they said, absolutely. So I then lived um, at Pucallpa, the retreat center. Mm -hmm for about a year and um and Whoa. studied under the hiranderos and served um ayahuasca to people and drank a lot of ayahuasca Whoa. during that time frame um and the reason being was that they, they, they considered a form of training is, mm -hmm. is going through all that and the marine and me really liked that understanding is that i was training mm -hmm. or helping people mm -hmm. and um, at the end of that year i was invited to a veteran retreat um, that was not at the retreat center I was working at, but it was in Iquitos mm -hmm. and a veteran retreat was basically supposed to, um, look at the effects of PTSD with ayahuasca. Mm -hmm. And, um, and to be honest, that's what I wanted to do when I was down in Peru the whole time was mm -hmm. serve some veterans because it helped me so much. And I wanted to, to help them. And when I had this opportunity, I just jumped on it. Um, at that retreat, I met Jesse Gould, who is the founder of Heroic Cards Project. Yeah. And and I met my wife um, at the same retreat. Oh, beautiful. So rather serendipitous. And wow. um That's great. And after I met after that retreat, Jesse mm -hmm. about a, about six or seven months later said, Hey Jared, we're gonna need a coach for Heroic Cards Project. And I didn't really even know what an integration coach was at mm -hmm. that time. Mm -hmm. uh, but when he described it to me as, you know, someone who helps them prepare and uh, helps them integrate their what they've learned when they get back home. And I was thinking, oh, I already do that. Mm -hmm. uh, then I got certified uh, through Being True to You, uh, mm -hmm. their integration program, which they're still running today. And it's a phenomenal mm -hmm. um, first step for anybody who's looking at becoming an integration coach. Mm -hmm. um, and and then we just started building this organization called Hero Carts. And that's. Mm -hmm. That's uh, in the long and short of it, how, how I got to this space and, and what Heroic Hearts does is we we send veterans to mm -hmm. um, to Peru and to Mexico and mm -hmm. to uh, in some legal domestic places now like Oregon mm -hmm. work with psychedelics um, in a in a group healing environment to help with their PTSD, anxiety, uh, mental trauma or even physical trauma. Um, but we just allow veterans to have access through our program uh, mm -hmm. with them. And now mm -hmm. we also have a very robust um, integration program mm -hmm. that is um, that prepares and helps them integrate when they get home. Mm -hmm. Wow. Wow. That's an amazing story, Jared. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I really appreciate you sharing. And, uh, you know, I mean, I hear it, you hear it. But, you know, I want to tell you, thank you for your service, certainly. And uh, more importantly, thank you for uh, your courage for uh, moving outside of your uh, outside of your comfort zone and uh, deciding to go ahead and 
look at alternative treatments that really helped you to reboot, reset, reframe. And, you know, there's this whole aspect of neurogenesis with these plants, you know, being able to go ahead and grow new connections uh, in the brain. And, uh, you know, I think that rewiring of the brain is so helpful. What can you explain um, and can you explain a little bit about ayahuasca and how it's used in the healing process uh, for veterans and what that what that looks like? Because a lot of people have heard about it, but they don't necessarily understand that, you know, this is a plant and, you know, the connection of the plant medicine and some people call it mother, grandmother, you know, mm -hmm. this whole idea of the plants really have a, a, an intelligence, if you will, that help you to see things perhaps that, you know, you don't want to see or right in front of you or help you to purge things out. But tell us a little bit more about what that looks like. Yeah. First, let me say um, to anybody that's listening, I came into this space the most skeptical person mm. you're ever going to meet. I was very grounded. I, I didn't. Uh, so a lot of these things that I came to understand was through my own experience of working down with the maestros and the, mm -hmm. and the maestros in, in Peru and then working with vets. So um, now that I've prefaced that ayahuasca, what ayahuasca mm -hmm. is, it's it's a combination of two plants. You have the ayahuasca vine and you have the chacruna leaf. And that the, when you combine these two plants into a mixture with water, they boil it down for about three days from a really big pot to a smaller one to a smaller one. It's uh, making a decoction. And these two plants are really important because one contains an MAOI, which is an it, it inhibits an enzyme in our stomach that would break down um, certain proteins mm -hmm. in our belly. Um, and one of these elements that it breaks down immediately is DMT. Hmm. So Chacruna has DMT in it and ayahuasca has an uh, inhibitor called an MAOI or a mononemine oxidase inhibitor. When you combine these two, now your body will send the DMT through the bloodstream and in past the blood brain barrier and you have a psychoactive effect. Hmm. This day we do not know how primitive man had figured out thousands of years ago to combine hmm. this with this, you get hmm. this without mm -hmm. like knowing. It's neurology. amazing, right? It's like, wow, what wizard did that? Yeah. Um, or who was the first one to try it too? Like, uh, you know, like, so yeah. we don't know to this day how that happened, but um, mm -hmm. we do know uh, method of action now about why this works mm -hmm. and what is going on. Um, so that is the, that is the, the chemical composition of what's going on with ayahuasca and how they, but they, but how they brew it down in Peru is they will, they'll stack it on top of each other and throughout this process they'll have one layer of vine one layer of leaf and they'll boil it for three days and during that time frame they are singing healing songs they're putting mm -hmm. deep intention into it they are keeping it as a sacred experience as it um and, and it's something that i think is lost in into the western community is that the the the, the spiritual idea of it. When I'm talking about spirituality, I'm not talking about religion. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about a, a connection or a, a, um, a relationship that a person has with their world, mm -hmm. with, with nature around them. And we as humans are nature itself. Mm -hmm. So your experience with that, that's your spirituality. Mm -hmm. And so they put a lot of their love into mm -hmm. this process, wow. which, um, mm -hmm. which is incredible. And, and, um, after that, they boil it down and bring it in. And so for us, um, with working with veterans, we found that these ancient uh, ceremonies that have been going on for about a thousand years, mm -hmm. uh, they do really well with veterans because for one thing, they're not usually one-on-one. -on -one. They're normally in groups. Usually mm -hmm. when you're drinking ayahuasca, you're doing it in groups of people. And there mm -hmm. is a profound healing effect when you are with groups of people. Mm -hmm. um, and we... Uh, work with the indigenous healers down there because they are working with a type of knowledge that we in the West don't really understand because it's um, really old mm -hmm. and sometimes too simplified for mm -hmm. us. Like we, we would make, we may call it viruses. They may call it spirits mm -hmm. in that mm -hmm. case. Like they've put mm -hmm. it into a different box that we have hangups for in our head. Mm -hmm. But we work with the indigenous healers um, down in Peru and in Mexico uh, because first of all, their traditions are important and they work. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's um, we're, f we're finding a lot of effect um, with working with this and then having the veteran go on a journey mm -hmm. to another place 
mm -hmm. puts everyone kind of on the same platform. Um, you're going to find it a lot of veteran retreats. There's a lot of, um, uh, we'll call it dick measuring. There's a lot of dick measuring mm -hmm. in the veteran community. And right. they, and so, uh, or metal, you know, like I've been on right. this deployment, I've done this, I've done that. Right. When you bring them to a place where that's really an unknown experience, it levels the playing field and everyone, everyone together now is on the same mm -hmm. ground because no one knows mm -hmm. how people are going to respond to the medicine. They don't know anything about the culture, all that stuff. So that effect alone, I think is hugely profound for the, mm -hmm. the, the idea of the hero's journey right. and how that can affect in our healing path as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so with that that's just the that's just mm -hmm. us sending them that's, to a retreat that's but amazing three, three weeks before that we send them uh we we give them a we give them a one-on-one -on -one coach they go through coaching mm -hmm. as well and they'll go through uh one-on-one -on -one coaching on the other side with group mm -hmm. coaching as well so it's a mm -hmm. it's a pretty big program that we've put together well wow. and you know it's it's so fascinating uh you know we we i, I think in the west uh, certainly in the u.s we have this sort of uh, concretization, this industrialization, this whole idea of material, mate, the material world, right? Rather than the spiritual world. And here you are, you're moving, uh, as you rightly put it, it it's, it's a great uh, monomyth, the hero's journey, you know, moving from the uh, outer world to the underworld and really meeting the masters and really meeting the demons and the dragons along the road. And then, you know, finding the pearl, finding that boon, and then, you know, really coming back up and being, you know, uh, greeted and, and taking those 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 treasures with you, the ability to go ahead and, and reframe. Uh, and then, you know, being able to go ahead and right size everyone, as you say, um, to, you know, put them in a place where everyone is equal, everyone's, you know, going to go ahead and be uh, on this journey, you know, and they all just from a veteran's viewpoint, uh, everyone really does respect each other and they rely on each other on one end. But then, you know, to your point, there's this dog, you know, who's the big, who's the alpha dog in the group, <laughs> but that kind of right sizes itself. Um, I'm wondering when you look at, um, you know, going down into the jungles and going ahead and working, um, you know, on these journeys, how do you ensure the safety of the veterans during the ayahuasca experience? What, what, what goes on there? And, you know, if someone's going in there and, uh, you know, has a hypertension or has other issues that might be, they might be dealing with, what does that look like? So each of the facilities that we work with, um, mm -hmm. they have a professional team of, mm -hmm. uh, facilitators, even one of our retreats has a doctor on site. So if there is something that would come along that mm -hmm. was a physical ailment or something that was a, a reaction in some way that was mm -hmm. not uh, needed, that would be available there. Um, the other retreat center we have is within uh, within a very short distance to an uh, to a hospital if needed, but they also mm -hmm. have medically trained staff um, there just in case something were to happen. Um, we have uh, and then. That's just at the retreat, but also we provide a really wonderful container mm. for them to be able to express themselves freely, mm -hmm. to be able to feel safe when they are there. Um, all food and everything is provided for them when they when they're on the retreat. We also provide them, like I said, with coaching. So even on the emotional standpoint of staying safe, they have a one on one uh, one on one coach that is um, completely personal to them and does not share anything about them with anyone. So you have all these layers of protection on top of that um, to go down to have this experience and mm. to have your emotional mm -hmm. uh, safety also considered. Mm. So that's really wonderful. So, you know, uh, we know uh, in the in the space specifically, everybody talks about set setting and integration. And what I hear you talking about is, you know, the ability to go ahead and not only establish those, but then to go ahead and work with the individual to activate whatever uh, mm -hmm. changes they see. How, how important is it for an individual when it comes to things like uh, you know, uh, how they react to the experience to have those in place before, during, and after. Well, I'll tell you from a person who's mm -hmm. done things recreationally and yes. from someone who's done things mm -hmm. um, on the more like therapy mm -hmm. side of stuff, mm -hmm. there is a paranoia that comes when you know you're not in like 
a mm -hmm. safe place. And I've had experiences uh, where I have taken a substance in uh, public areas, for instance, like at mm -hmm. a festival or a concert. Um, and it did not turn out well for me mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. because I got very scared. I felt very um, mm -hmm. unsafe because I didn't know people around me. Um, and eventually mm -hmm. I couldn't even listen to the music anymore. I had to go run to my tent and, and mm -hmm. keep to myself. So, and it did not, and, and more importantly, not having these things in place to make me feel safe to express and go through this experience, mm -hmm. no matter how it looks, what it, it allowed me to go deeper into myself because it because as if you don't have those safety mechanisms out there for you um you don't go very deep in mm -hmm. because you're so focused on making sure that you are okay mm -hmm. right if you know you're okay and someone else is going to take care of you if you have if you really need it man it's way easier just to relax and allow mm -hmm. the process to go mm -hmm. yeah yeah i mean we've all we've all had that experience where you know, even, I mean, to simplify it, I mean, when you're, when you go into a restaurant and somebody doesn't come to your table, you know, it's sort of a very different dining experience uh, when you, you know, you have to wait for a while or whatever, and you're not feeling like you're taken care of. And that's just a minor, that's not like psychic surgery or emotional, you know, emotional plumbing where you're really going down and trying to unplug some of the unplug some of the traumas that have been there or some of the issues that you might have. So, so that's nice. That's a, that's a wonderful capability that you've got throughout the heroic hearts project uh, process. I'm wondering if you can share some of the success stories of maybe some veterans, uh, you know, who've gone undergone the plant medicine process with you. You have, I mean, obviously you don't have to talk about names, but you know, maybe there might be one or two that you can share. Um, so I will say that from from what our evidence is showing, and we have mm -hmm. some data to back this up, we're looking at it about 90% of the veterans that we send mm -hmm. have a an overall um, change of life for themselves um, mm. in a positive setting is the best way to put it with it's not mm -hmm. so scientific. But um, and then the other 10% still had a change in life, but it wasn't as dramatic. Um, mm -hmm. And so the some of the stories that came out of this is we've had guys who um i had a i had a client once who his his life was was going fine as far as like on the surface he had a good job he had a family he had a kids but mm -hmm. he just could not connect anymore and he was very he, uh he just didn't feel um like he felt like he wasn't even in love with his wife anymore he mm -hmm. felt like he wasn't in love with his kids he didn't feel any of that and and so we worked with him through this process and then when uh, after he came back from his experience he told me that he understood what love really was and that he never really allowed himself to express that or to feel that love mm -hmm. so when he came home uh, his his behavior changed almost like night and day for him mm -hmm. where he was much more connected with his family he was much more gentle to his kids Beautiful. He, he started moving into a different career base that was more revolved around service instead of around uh, finance. So uh, that that's just one of, of those. I mean, we have um, more subtle stuff as well, where where people start to understand that most of their um, the stuff that they're working on actually had more to do with their childhood than it did with their military experience. And this is also across the board. Many of us find with psychedelics, it's a lot to do with our childhood. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so, but they will, they will take steps forward into maybe repairing some damage mm -hmm. that they may have caused in their life that, um, that maybe they don't connect with their father anymore. Mm -hmm. And they reached out and had a phone call with their dad, which they haven't done in 15 years, mm -hmm. which to me is, is it, I mean, absolutely huge where they had written a person off and they just needed to then give them a call and tell them, Hey, I know it's okay, you know, forgive them in whatever way. So, um, I, I, I could, I could really go on for, for mm -hmm. hours on, on certain right. little things that people do, um, or have done since the medicine that always blow me away. Mm. Cause I'll tell you when I, sometimes when I start this process, I, um, I'm, I'm always like, man, I don't know mm -hmm. if this is gonna, if, <laughs> if this will be doing the thing and if it will help and they come back and it's, uh, it's, mm. inc it's incredible. The results I see. You know, I talk about, uh, I, I like to talk about, you know, change your story, change your life. And it sounds to me like what the medicine uh, is able to do for these individuals is really allow them to back away from the story that they might have had 
and reframe that story in a different way and then kind of just kind of have a broader perspective on who they are and how they themselves can change their story and change their life. And that's 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 absolutely amazing. Are there cases where, uh, you know, people go down and, you know, they just don't feel anything? Yes, that is uh, that is actually more common than mm -hmm. people would imagine. We have found that um, that high levels of cannabis usage actually have contributed to this in in the space. Mm -hmm. Again, this is anecdotal evidence. We don't have any studies that show this. So mm -hmm. uh, anybody out there who says I've done this, I've I've worked with cannabis and ayahuasca mm -hmm. and have not had a block, but um, but we mm -hmm. have had a correlation with veterans who have a hard time coming off of cannabis for this retreat. Usually, mm -hmm. I have a hard time connecting. Um, but usually, and usually, usually, I understand though the cannabis use is sort of like you should stay away from it for uh, a few weeks, if not a month, yeah. right? A part of a, a part of ayahuasca entails having a diet before you go down mm -hmm. there to get your mm -hmm. body as clean as possible. Right. Uh, this medicine involves physical and emotional purging, and if your mm -hmm. body is not clean, in a sense, more purging can continue. And there's much more nuances to that, which um, we don't need to get into. So Kentucky Fried Chicken is a no-no, huh? Yeah, I mean, like, yeah, I, I, I would not suggest. Yeah. You know, you want to have a case of the munchies before you go down. And, you know, this is not yeah. a recreational sport. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it does happen where veterans mm -hmm. do go down and, mm -hmm. and not have a, a psycho, a psychedelic experience mm -hmm. that maybe they were expecting. Mm. And that's part of the lesson that I tell everyone when you're going into these spaces, especially when the intention is healing. If your intention is healing, then let's keep that the intention instead of I want visions or I want this, mm. or, I want to go through this crazy experience. Right. Because even those veterans that we have sent down that did not have a strong effect, they got different kinds of medicine on our retreats that mm -hmm. has helped them immensely. Mm -hmm. um, and, and this is also from my personal perspective, the um and many others but the the songs that the healers sing in peru mm -hmm. originally when before westerners were drinking ayahuasca only the healer would drink ayahuasca and sing their songs to people and it would apparently heal them mm. and i have seen the effect of these kind these songs that are are very i mean they're really far out there these mm -hmm. sounds of these songs but when they sing these songs it helps people so i i called Icaros. I like to tell the veterans that more Icaros, more healing. It's not mm -hmm. more medicine, more healing. Mm -hmm. really more like Icaros, it. more healing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The reason I say this is because it's the, they are using their, the sounds and the movement of their voice to mm -hmm. direct the energy of this healing energy to do whatever it does. It's a symbiotic relationship between the, the maestro and the ayahuasca, mm -hmm. ayahuasca down there. So, mm -hmm. Not that you can't get profound healing effects without having a maestro, mm -hmm. but having one, especially one who's trained and been doing this for a very long time, mm -hmm. um, they uh, have the ability to help mm -hmm. direct that energy mm -hmm. faster, almost like a scalpel. I guess that's yeah. even an advice. A scalpel can be an amazing tool for a trained surgeon, but mm -hmm. to an amateur, it could cause a lot of damage. Yeah, the visions I'm getting right now are sort of like, you know, we're the instruments and, uh, you know, having a well-tuned in instrument uh, before you go into the orchestra pit with a with a good uh, maestro mm -hmm. who is able to go ahead and uh, conduct, uh, you know, the, 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 the healing process through sound and through tuning is much more effective than if you're going down there and you haven't tuned it up and you haven't done anything at all. And that is all about trust and about the environment, about having a really healing environment. I'm wondering um, what your thoughts are in terms of uh, looking at, you had mentioned uh, the integration process and about how important that is. Um, I'm wondering, uh, how do you help uh, integrate, uh, you know, experiences and insights gained through the ayahuasca ceremony into everyday lives? Uh, because, you know, I know this will open people up, the medicine will open people up, and uh, then you come back and you might want to go ahead and hug everybody, but you come back to the same matrix, right? To the same container that you were in before, which might have been the source of the problem. So I'm wondering from your view, what does that look like? And you know, what, what, what's that process look like? 
Yeah, it's a great question. So um, it's very individualized because just like the experience with ayahuasca or any other psychedelic is going to be extremely personal. Um, as we go through that process of I get is as a coach, I'm getting to know them about a month before they go down to drink ayahuasca and I find out kind of where they're at mm -hmm. and what's going on. And we're working on getting a diet in so they can get ready for the experience. Mm -hmm. So a lot of stuff is going to be coming up during that time in that three weeks. This kind of gives me a good perspective on what they may be dealing with or working mm. with when they're down there. So if, say if someone's working on a lot of anger, they got a lot of anger and they get really angry, they're probably gonna go through some sort of um, experience involving that. And it might not be like horrendous. It could be you overfill with love and you have your anger is gone. Who knows what it'll look mm -hmm. like for the person. Mm -hmm. um, but when they come back, and a lot of times when people come back, um, I, I think, psychedelics not just ayahuasca but psychedelics and this experience combined is a big destabilizer for people mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so if they come back into uh from a place where they're much more open and they are allowed to talk and they are allowed to be themselves mm -hmm. in with in a, in a very low judgment to no judgment zone um then they come back home to all of that noise and chaos again mm -hmm. so for myself i always say take it slow mm. be very very slow slow enough where you can start to recognize what fits and what doesn't mm -hmm. so they come off a very a very strict diet and if they a lot of them maybe want to come home and have like kentucky fried chicken as you said <laughs> it's their favorite thing and so i would tell them i would say okay get half of what you normally would and mm -hmm. eat one piece and sit with it mm -hmm. and see how you feel about it see how your body responds to it mm -hmm. because after the experience with ayahuasca as you said people are much more open and they're much mm -hmm. more sensitive to their bodies because they are now most of them have never been this clean probably in their life mm -hmm. after working with ayahuasca so you really can start to tell the difference of like when your body doesn't like a certain thing mm -hmm. or not right after ayahuasca so this includes relationships, this includes jobs, this includes everything. So I tell people after that big experience, take a very slow entry into mm -hmm. it. And this will teach them to practice using their voice and setting boundaries. If they mm -hmm. actually are saying like, hey, I am not prepared to deal with this at this moment. I need to take a break and I need to step back because of um, I'm still processing this experience or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and then mm -hmm. secondly, not only do they get to practice their own voice, but they really get to see, man, <laughs> this truck that I bought that's taking most of my my uh, my check away. I bought this out of a place of uh, entitlement or out of a place of validation, and that doesn't fit anymore because I don't feel like I need that that. Right. So they sell that truck, or they or they start moving into a direction that seems to be more fitting to this version of themselves that feels better than the one that they were in. Mm -hmm. uh, and, mm -hmm. and so these tools can be anything from uh, learning more mindfulness, mm -hmm. learning more like, and really, and that's really what I'm talking about here is having them slow down and try to be more mindful of their surroundings. Mm -hmm. uh, but I will say this is I tell everybody, don't make any big decisions right. in your life right after you do this right. experience because right. Um, speed usually causes trauma mm. to the environment around us. Mm -hmm. So yeah. you take it slow, you slowly leave your job, mm -hmm. you slowly decide to get out of your relationships, right. you slowly do these things, you can actually be mindful of making as less damage mm -hmm. to your life as possible as you're closing and opening new doors. Mm -hmm. Great. So I use this term in my coaching practice, you know, to seed, weed, feed and grow, you know, uh, don't pull up the garden, just, you know, seed, weed, feed and grow the garden. Uh, and that means pruning and taking care of stuff. But I'm glad you brought up mindfulness because, um, you know, that's the heart of uh, uh, practice of, of, of my book, The Mindfulness Experience, the name of the podcast, which is around, you know, the mind, the body, the spirit, food fuel if you will as well as recharging so learning those tips and then also uh, really looking at your relationships your environment and your aspirations what do you want to breathe life into the world with and it sounds to me like you're really giving the opportunity 
to go ahead and do a full examination of what the garden is, what needs to be pruned, what needs to be, you know, weeded, if you will, and what needs to be fed and so on and so forth. I guess the activation uh, part of that uh, is uh, really important. So the community um, uh, that surrounds the Heroic Hearts Project and the ongoing uh, integration process really helps to support that by learning some of these tools. Is that is that is that the way it works? Yeah. So we we start them off when they start our program with a 21 day mindfulness mm -hmm. course for veterans, and it's right. the, the basics of learning to sit, breathe, and observe. Mm -hmm. and, and that is uh, we we have them all go through a 21 day course before Beautiful. they get into coaching, so that way they have some kind of uh, practice in it and. I'll tell you, this is this is a, a tool that I use to to talk with veterans. But mm -hmm. for anybody out there who may be thinking about doing this, um, this is mindfulness is actually training you for tough psychedelic experiences. Mm -hmm. If you can if you can hold your focus on your breath or on a focal point during mm -hmm. a tough psychedelic experience, you can also do it in life. You can carry that same awareness of self into the rest of your life. So I tell veterans that you are that that don't like to meditate or don't want to sit and breathe or don't want to do these things. I let them know that you're training for a hard ceremony, which gets them more amped to actually do the discipline for it when there's a goal involved. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So for anybody out there listening, that you can take that if you will, because but I, I'm living proof that it's true. Like you can get through. Um, I've gone through all my my very hard ceremonies through breathing and mindfulness. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's really uh, quite amazing. You know, I I I I talk about mindfulness in terms of breathing, and if you know the best sharpshooters in the world are people who learn how to control their breath, learn how to focus, learn how to go ahead and and you know you can also use that in terms of your relationships and in terms of just being presence having presence is is huge being present to yourself and offering compassion and love to yourself so you're really offering this through the 21 day program and then afterwards there's more yeah so the 21 day program is just the initial mm -hmm. online course that they mm -hmm. do and then they get signed up with their coach and then they go through three weeks of mm -hmm. integration coaching, mm -hmm. go to their retreat, and then they do another three to four weeks of integration coaching after their retreat. So this is just what we're starting them with is that 21 day course. And mm -hmm. it's, uh, and it's short. It's not, it's like, you know, 10, 15 minutes a day, but, um, but that's, that's the idea is not to, not to hammer it in there or make it like an advanced course. It's just to help those who need some support on that side. Mm -hmm. So I want to talk about like, uh, you know, going into the process and obviously somebody who's going into it, you go down there, you, you, or you're ready to go down, you have the 21 day course. And I'm wondering about stigmas and misconceptions that you might've come across in terms of using the plant medicines for healing. And how do you, how do you go through that with individuals you know, what might they be like, you know, because one of the things that's really um, very, very evident is that, you know, change requires commitment and commitment, the nature of commitment is challenge, right? So mm -hmm. we get like really challenged about like, once we make a commitment, it's like, oh shit, I made a commitment. What am I doing? You know, and then all the arguments come up and, and so on and so forth. What's been your experience with that? So the psychedelic stigma has been a hurdle. Um, mm -hmm. I will say it's getting easier for it to not be such a big hurdle because information is so readily available. Um, you can just Google facts now about uh, psilocybin. I will tell anybody who does this, mm -hmm. there is still a lot of misinformation about there. Like, like for instance, the LD50 of, um, of psilocybin is not correct on the government websites and the LD50 of like MDMA is much lower than it actually is in real life. Um, LD50, for those that don't know, is the lethal dose um, mm -hmm. for 50 percent of the populace. But um, but so the information is out there, especially on uh, nonprofit work like MAPS has done many studies like we have done studies on on psilocybin and on ayahuasca. And so these studies are out there. Um, so the stigma is getting less. Mm -hmm. But most of the time, the stigma just comes from a fear based response mm -hmm. based on um, the war on drugs. Right. Some of it's loosely based in truth and others is not like mm. uh, there were there have been many people who've had freakouts on psychedelics. 
um, um, in an unsupervised setting that was with like proper facilitators and have gotten hurt or killed. There mm -hmm. is, there have been people who have had psychotic breaks from psychedelics, but none of them actually have had permanent psychotic breaks. Mm -hmm. We've had, we've had activations of, um, of mm -hmm. trauma that have affected into things like schizophrenia for those who have a family mm -hmm. history of schizophrenia. So those things are, are real and these risks mm -hmm. are there, but through proper medical screening and having mm -hmm. a closed container and having certain uh, safety mechanisms put involved mm -hmm. with facilitators and health practitioners, these risks are so easily mitigated. Mm -hmm. I mean, like so easily mitigated. Um, mm -hmm. But they, I want people to understand that these risks do do exist. But that's the most of the time the stigmas that I have from veterans is they understand that they are stigmas, but they don't. Mm -hmm. They don't. They're another word for stigma would be wives' tale. You know, like, oh, right. so am I going to turn into a hippie after this? No, mm -hmm. man, you're not. Um, am I going to lose my mind? No, mm -hmm. man, you may, but not for a long time. Right. Like, you'll you'll come back to who you are now. Like, right. you may change your mind, but you may yeah, not may lose your mind. Your mind <laughs> but your, but your, your sober stated consciousness mm -hmm. um, may not change in, um, in a way that you're even noticing because it's subconscious stuff where it's mm -hmm. like psychedelics for me, at least uh, how I understand them is they do a lot of subconscious work, mm -hmm. which right. then tears into conscious stuff. Mm -hmm. So um, it's, it is a mind altering substance, but we have not found a, a lot, a lot of cases where the mind altering has had mm -hmm. harmful effects, more growth mm -hmm. effects. Hmm. So it really helps to amplify maybe what's already there, maybe take a look at it a little different, reboot, reset, reframe. And then, you know, from a, a contraindication viewpoint, the screening process that happens beforehand will help weed out at least hopefully some of that. From a therapeutic viewpoint, uh, do you, uh, one of the things I was very interested in as you started to talk about the therapeutic versus the re recreational uh, in your view, uh, when we look at plant medicine therapy, you know, using it as a uh, psychedelic, uh, because you know I'm a psychedelic assisted therapy provider, but from your view, can you kind of talk to that in a way that might uh, open it up a little bit when you compare it with, let's say, traditional forms of therapy? So I think that us in the West have got the right idea about using psychedelics as a, a therapy mechanism mm -hmm. um, and using it as a tool for therapists to use with people. But if we're talking about a plant medicine like ayahuasca and having a therapist there, mm -hmm. there's not much therapy that the person will be doing with them in ceremony besides making sure that they're safe and letting them have their experience. Mm -hmm. Um, and to interfere with that experience by trying to begin with talk therapy, for instance, I think it actually caused more damage mm -hmm. than actually using uh, things in this way because the, um, and so I don't want to discredit modern mm -hmm. therapy and where it's going. And I think that we're doing really well. Um, but if we're comparing an apples to apples comparison, mm -hmm. when it comes to indigenous healing, one thing that is missing in a lot of these practices is the spiritual side. Mm. That. I don't think that can be replicated. I don't think that can be taken away from it. Mm -hmm. This this means like working in nature, like out in the forest or out in an open field mm -hmm. or out in these places where like you can connect more with the earth where you don't feel so closed in with our boxes. Um, this would include also using like uh, songs or things that 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 have that mm -hmm. may seemingly have nothing to do with the situation and we kind of do this now with with therapy with putting mm -hmm. headphones on We're, we've mm -hmm. recognized the emotional stimulus that comes from music but um what's going on down in peru is a thousand years of tradition mm -hmm. of using certain songs to direct so kind of like using a chemotherapy but going into laser therapy mm -hmm. so instead of mm -hmm. a whole body thing they're laser mm -hmm. in certain points so these songs have been learned through uh, a myriad of ways, but the, the, these songs are directed mm -hmm. into opening up the heart. The Ikaros, out, yeah. The, yeah, the Ikaros are, are doing this. And and I don't, I don't know if there's a way I can bridge that to the West without them actually experiencing it themselves, because at this time, I don't know if there's a way to measure this. Mm -hmm. uh, now, I also want to let you know my self-awareness, I'm coming at it from my lens, which could mm -hmm. be completely biased because right. my first big experience with ayahuasca was with indigenous healers and that could have 
completely changed the landscape for me. But across the board, I'm seeing incredible, not just mental, but physical healings from people mm. that are going down to Peru and working with these healers. Mm. And I don't see people coming out of MDMA therapy saying like, oh, my cancer is cured. Mm. Or, oh man, my uh, my diabetes is gone. Mm -hmm. Or, oh man, like uh, this, mm -hmm. my, my TBI is completely fixed. Mm -hmm. like, I'm just not seeing that. Um, what I'm, but I am seeing that in Peru. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a there's a, a lot to uh, be said about sound resonance and around, you know, the residents of your environment, the residents of the people that you're with, the community community and the communication that happens, and the trust. You know what trust does and what compassion does. I mean, those are real incredible healers uh, and. Uh, you know that what they what they really do is they uh, really uh, allow endorphins, serotonin, oxytocin, allow all the good stuff to come up, and really allow subs uh, the 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 cortisol levels to subside and allow that healing to begin. So it's it's wonderful that you're uh, creating this space. Uh, tell me a little bit about uh, the uh, heroic hearts project work and how. Uh, it supports veterans. In other words, your work specifically. How do how do people get involved? Uh, you know, or find out more about the Heroic Hearts Project. What's the process, if you will, uh, to get involved uh, with uh, one of these retreats? So um, the process for any veteran uh, that would be looking to this retreat um, or any retreats is we we have a, a application on our website mm -hmm. and we will and then or in it, you can add yourself to a mailing list as well and we'll you can jump in on what we call open enrollment mm -hmm. and we'll actually be doing that um, here on next Monday which I know the podcast will be out differently so that's the 18th. Mm -hmm our next open enrollment and that will be covering our next uh few months of retreats and mm -hmm. so we work on kind of a first come first serve and then we open enrollment again and again and once mm -hmm. your name is in our system you are now added to our mailing list so you'll know when these enrollments happen mm -hmm. um once you get once you get your application submitted it will be then read by someone in our team and that application will then go into review. And that review means that you're gonna get a vetting call. Someone's mm -hmm. gonna call you and basically talk about uh, how you found us, what your intentions mm -hmm. for going to this, and just mm -hmm. kind of get a basis of where you're at. Mm -hmm. um, and then after that, it goes into our medical screeners, which they will mm -hmm. do a medical screening uh, for you to make sure that you are medically cleared to do this. And then once all that's been done and approved, um, we then ask that you give a $500 donation to us. Mm -hmm. So that way that pays for uh, your flights or anything else and, um, and and also kind of pays it forward to the next one. That's And that's a minimum donation. Right. People who can pay more, we pre we ask that you do. We're still a small nonprofit mm -hmm. and uh, your, your work goes to other people. So, um, so they pay that, they pay the amount that works for them. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then after that, they get assigned to their coach mm -hmm. and then they start their process. Um, and this can happen very fast. People can get mm -hmm. an email within like a seven week period. And then in six wow. more weeks, they'll be going to Peru. Wow. So we're trying to That's stretch great. this out a little bit more, but um, it can be happening really fast. So if you have put your application in, please keep your, uh, your, your eyes on your email, check your spam folders, all that stuff. Cause that's where we'll be notifying you. Mm -hmm. The process is starting. Excellent. Excellent. Well, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm really excited for the work you're doing. And, uh, you know, I'm, uh, as you well know, a healthcare ambassador for uh, the Heroic Hearts Project and uh, very excited to have you on the show. Uh, and I hope that uh, we can get a lot of people uh, not only involved with the work you're doing, but also to go ahead and donate for this worthy cause, because you really are changing uh, you yourself and the project itself is changing the lives of many veterans. And it's uh, really, uh, really very much needed. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Jared, for sharing your knowledge and experience with us on the Mindfulness Experience podcast. It's inspiring to see the work you're doing and the support you're providing for veterans in their healing journeys. If you want to contact Jared, email him at jared.reinhart, that's R-I-N-E-H-A-R-T, at heroicheartsproject.org. To learn more about the Heroic Hearts Project and how you can support their work, please visit their website at 
www.heroicheartsproject.org. Thank you for listening to the Mindfulness Experience Podcast. We'll see you next time.